Welcome, guys, to the World XP Podcast. This is episode number 25. Uh, kind of inadvertently ended up being a special Q&A episode for, for episode 25. I didn't actually realize that this was going to be episode 25 when I, when I was like, oh, let's do Q&A. But I figured since we were having some of the, the vaccines were starting to roll out, um, it's been in the news that Johnson & Johnson is releasing one. Um, some of them are two shots, some are one, so I figured it would be a good idea to get you guys back on um, to sort of discuss discuss uh, these sorts of things. Um, so I did post on Instagram basically just asking for uh, some questions, but before we get into that, do you guys want to do a quick sort of recap um, of sort of your backgrounds and that sort of thing? I know you guys were on episode seven, but for those who didn't get a chance to watch that episode, I think it would be good to sort of to, to go around the horn and, and do a quick recap. So Katie, we can start with you. Yeah, um, Katie Yost. Um, I'm getting my PhD in cancer biology at Stanford. Um, and so I've worked a little bit on tumor immunology. Um, so that's kind of my immunology background. Um, so not specifically vaccines, but there's definitely you know some overlap there. So Chris. Great. Um, so yeah, my my background is similar to Katie's. So I did my uh, my PhD down at Johns Hopkins, um, and then came up to the Harvard Medical Group to, uh, with the Brigham and Women's Hospital to do a postdoc up there. Um, and the whole time I've been in, in cancer immunology, um, so doing different things there. And then um, from there, I went over into the um, into the private sector of research, and now I am a principal scientist at Werewolf Therapeutics. Tom. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I've got a similar background to both Katie and Chris, uh, more tumor immunology. So much like Katie, I you know, understand vaccines. I've had experience with them, but it's not my primary field. But I do think that between the three of us, we've got a pretty firm grasp. Um, but yeah, I'm also at Johns Hopkins doing my PhD, I should say. Sounds good. And then I think one other sort of thing to get out of the way is just so everybody listening understands um, sort of the nature of what you guys do versus like how it relates to vaccines. And so we can get, so people listening can get sort of a background on um, your understanding of, of them and sort of like what, how what you guys are doing relates to that. So uh, Chris, if you wanna go ahead and give sort of like a little background on that and then Katie and Tom, if you guys feel the need to jump in, please feel free. Sure, yeah, so um, the three of us work in a field that's sort of, that's focused on trying to get the immune system uh, harnessed in the anti-cancer arena. Uh, and so the idea is generally to, to generate therapeutics that will activate the patient's immune system and use that to fight the cancer as opposed to like a chemotherapy or, or some kind of radiation. Um, and so one of the tangents of that that I'm, I'm pretty sure all three of us have touched on at some point um, is that there's a pretty healthy field within that field um, that is specific for cancer vaccines, right? So the idea being that you could generate a vaccine for cancer um, in an attempt to activate the immune system. And so while the three of us don't, you know, we wouldn't say that we're viral, you know, epidemiologists or, or maybe infectious disease experts. Um, the thing about cancer immunotherapy and cancer immunology is that it touches most fields. Um, and so I'd say we probably all have a pretty basic understanding of vaccines um, in the, in the instance of cancer, but also in a variety of other kind of immunology based fields, right? So we can all probably speak to basic developmental biology or infectious diseases or um, kind of basic medical knowledge. And so we, we've got a pretty broad set of skills that I think, you know, makes it easier for us to kind of assess these things. Um, and the three of us spend a lot of time reading papers that that are being used to, to drive policy in, in the COVID arena as well. So for, most, for the three of us, it's pretty easy for us to pick through a paper and find the things that are important and the things that aren't. Um, and that I think is helpful too, you know, in terms of, especially for something like a Q and A where we can kind of, we can cite the primary sources, um, and look at them and see how well their claims hold up. You guys agree with that for the most part? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Perfect. And I think ho hopefully we'll be able to talk about this a little bit more too, but I think, you know, what's really interesting about the new COVID vaccines is, you know, it's kind of a new, um, methodology for vaccines. These are mRNA vaccines, which are kind of, it's kind of like, you know, the first big use case for them. So um, my lab, you know, does a lot of RNA biology. So I think, you know, um, that kind of gives a little bit of context um, to how these vaccines are working, why they're different than kind of more, um, more standard, um, you know, historically how vaccines have been developed. So hopefully we can talk about that a little bit too. Well, we can do that now, actually. I, I had forgot okay. that this was a new sort of vaccine. Um, can you sort of describe how 
this one works in particular compared to other vaccines that we that people are might be more familiar with? Yeah, um, I guess I can start and you guys feel free to jump in and interrupt me. Um, but uh, so, you know, in biology, if you kind of think about the you know, central dogma is what people refer to a lot. So this is, you know, the process of going from DNA, which is kind of the genetic template um, to RNA um, and then to protein. Um, so you know, RNA is kind of this intermediate that is the, uh, like the copy of the instructions that then gets translated into a functional protein product. And so historically, most vaccines have either been kind of an inactivated version of the virus itself or a specific protein component. So kind of the last part of you know, this, this stepwise going from DNA to RNA um, to protein. And so the, um, the two COVID vaccines, so the one from Pfizer and the one from Moderna, um, instead, give just the mRNA instructions. And so there was a lot of like technical advances as to why this is hard. So mRNA itself is kind of sensed by the immune system and can and you can trigger an immune response by itself. So there's a lot of work done to kind of work around that. So you don't trigger an unwanted immune response, but the one, but specifically one for the, you know, the viral protein that you're trying to generate one against. Um, and so that's why these haven't been used as, as uh, much in the past. Um, and so, you know, because of all these advancements now, these are able to be used and they have a lot of advantages. You know, mRNA is much more, it's much easier to produce um, in mass and then to, add, to make small modifications to. Um, so, you know, that's why these were so quick to be developed, um, which is great, you know, for dealing with this pandemic, which is a really pressing need. Um, so often we don't, aren't, don't have a such short turnaround for vaccine development. Um, and I think just one example as, you know, how this will be beneficial even going forward is, you know, I think Moderna is working on some variant specific versions of the vaccines. Basically, they just have to make one small um, change in the mRNA template and then kind of have, you know, a vaccine that will now work against um, these new variants that are popping up. So, um, you know, I think it like it's what, something that's good that's come out of that is that, you know, this is allowed for these kind of new types of vaccines um, to be developed and used widely. Um, just for my own curiosity then, because obviously we've heard like the new UK variant or the new different variants, is this mRNA vaccine sort of probably the best case scenario to change with a different variant? Yeah, I think that it's definitely, you know, it's much easier to make that small modification and mm -hmm. then to produce the amount of RNA that you would need. Um, it's much faster to do that than to produce the amount of protein product you would need or, you know, to culture enough virus to use like a kind of um, dead virus type vaccine. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, are the vaccines that we have now, are they effective against the variant? I think this is, these are like, you know, these are currently under investigation, so we don't know exactly how effective they are. Um, hopefully, you know, they're still pretty effective against some of these variants that are popping up, um, but I think it's not entirely clear yet, so. Sounds good. Tom, you got anything to add to, to either of those points? I think that was a brilliant explanation of it. Uh, nice work, Katie. So I, I agree with everything she said, and I, I think this is a new technology in a relative sense. You know, Moderna has been working on mRNA vaccines for 10 going on 11 years now. Um, so it's new to the field, but you know they are very good at what they do, and it does offer an opportunity to have uh, a platform that can address these variants very quickly. When there's a mutation in the RNA code, uh, Moderna and Pfizer can just tweak the vaccine to reflect that and then have a new version of the vaccine out pretty quickly, as opposed to the traditional protein-based ones where they then need to uh, generate new protein that resembles the variant and then test it and then send it back out. It's uh, just a very exciting time to be in the world of vaccines. Uh, also, I apologize. I recently got a new dog, so you may hear her whining in the background. <laughs> all good. All good. One last of my own curiosity uh, questions. And with the new variants running around, would you need to get vaccines for each variant or would like the initial one do, do the job enough that you wouldn't need to get a second version of the vaccine or how, would, how does that kind of work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. The... Um, it's funny, I just saw a preprint print um, yesterday or the day before. So there's a couple of publications now that are trying to address how the old immune, like the immune response to the old vaccine or to, to just getting COVID um, mm -hmm. responds to the variants. Um, and for a number of the variants that I've seen, most of the publications that I've seen, they've been pretty small numbers of patients, but they all kind of point towards the current vaccines being sufficient. Um, they don't see a lot of difference, not at least a concerning amount of difference between the response of people who are vaccinated um, to any of the given variants. So it, it looks like the vaccines from for now um, seem sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an interesting question because it, it sort of comes back to um, how you got it. So 
it depends what part of the protein that your immune system ended up making a response to. So the short answer is you'd probably have a little bit of protection um, because your immune system doesn't just, usually it doesn't just sort of pick one spot to focus on. And so when we're talking about variants, right, what we're talking about is the spike protein on the viral envelope. Um, so it's one protein that the, that the virus uses to then, it's on the outside of the virus and it uses it to get in to the host cells, right? So it's, you know, that, hence the name of the spike. Um, when people talk about a variant, what they're talking about is part of that protein that they've switched one or two protein, uh, amino acids, right? So amino acids are the things that build proteins. And so you get a list of those that then folds into a protein. And what you do is you'll occasionally get the list changes the amino acid, you know, you swap in a new Duplo, right? Mm -hmm. So like you had a red, blue, green, yellow, and now you go red, blue, green, yellow, green, right? Like you, you swap out. I think I gave the same colors and let me try that again, red, blue, green, yellow, <laughs> and then you go red, blue, yellow, green, right? And so if you were focusing on that sequence of four, um, you'd miss it, right? Because you, this, it's now a different sequence of four. Um, but what tends to happen is the, so something like your antibody response could be focused on that one sequence of four, but your total immune response is gonna pick apart different parts of that protein. Um, so it's unlikely that sort of a single amino acid is gonna get you totally free of a, a, an immune response. So I think the, the most likely scenario is that these will end up being sufficient. Um, that would be my prediction, at least. Yeah, yeah. And something that I, I haven't read too much like specifically about this, but something I've kind of like heard anecdotally is that a lot of the, like there are many different variants that are popping up and they're kind of named generally for like where they were identified. Um, but I think that there's been convergence on kind of, you know, what part of the spike epitope is being um, changed. So, you know, even though we're talking about all these, like a number of different variants that are cropping up, um, they're probably more similar than um, to each other. Um, so it's something I forgot. I don't know if you guys have specific yeah, I specific to add to that, but yeah, yeah. no, I agree. And, and I think, I'll make, go ahead, Tom. Go after you. So I just one other point I'd like to point out um, is that people don't know that there's there's actually when you look at it from a like a genotype view, there are thousands of variants. Mm -hmm. right? There's not like five. There's like thousands. There's probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, yeah. running around. Um, but like Jenna, or like sorry, well, like Katie said. Sorry, I was thinking of your sister. Um, yeah. what, so what Katie pointed out is good is that the, the programs, the, the viruses tend to converge in certain spots. So you have thousands of variants, mm -hmm. but a couple spots tend to give it an advantage. And then, so those grow out, right? The, mm -hmm. As opposed to being sort of non-productive. But there, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of variants running around at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in that vein, I think it's important to note too, that we talk about variants because there, uh, for instance, in this case, the spike protein is having some sort of amino acid change, which is potentially changing the spike protein just a little bit. Um, but there's actually a sweet spot here where if the spike protein changes too much, it no longer works. So mm -hmm. the virus can't drastically change it. It has to subtly change it. So there actually is a little bit of selective pressure here where the right variant has to come along. You can't just change everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine a car, right? If you're looking for a blue car and we make it a red car, it's still a car. It can still drive. It can still do stuff. So maybe you can avoid detection. Uh, if I take the four wheels off, that is also a variation. We have changed the car. Uh, the car no longer works, right? So I don't actually care if I can't recognize it because it's non-functional. So there is a, mm -hmm. a sweet spot here where these variants have to change the spike protein to avoid the immune system, but they can't change the spike protein so much that it doesn't function as the spike protein anymore. Uh, hence this convergent evolution idea where there are lots of variations, but they're all happening in roughly the same part of the spike protein, because if you mess with other parts, it doesn't work anymore, right? So with that, we can have this kind of cross coverage because there's only so much it can change before it no longer works. Uh, and that's an important idea that if it could change it drastically, then it could avoid in a heartbeat, but it can't. It has to play by certain rules too. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So what I'm hearing is the current vaccines are sufficient. <laughs> All evidence. Long, against long story yeah. short, yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's get into let's get into some of the questions that we that we've got now. Um, so the first one is from well, the first two are from Taryn, but the first one is I've heard that even after getting the vaccine, you will still have to quarantine from some jobs if you come into contact with someone with COVID. If the vaccine is meant to stop the spread, then why are people having to quarantine after contact? Shouldn't it increase your immunity to 
increase your immunity to being even a carrier. Mm -hmm. That's so, a tough one. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I'm happy to lead us off if you guys want. <laughs> Uh, feel free to, to jump in and add or correct anything you see fit. But I think the takeaway here is it's, it's sort of like running up a score, right? Um, winning is about winning. It's not about winning gracefully, right? So 95% success means one out of 20 people it doesn't work for, right? Mm -hmm. At least not, not noticeably. Uh, so extrapolate one out of 20 to 320 million people in the United States. There is a chunk of people that this don't, won't work for. And it doesn't mean it isn't a successful vaccine. It's a highly successful vaccine. It means 5% of 320 million people it could potentially fail for, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't know which of the 20 it is. And this is assuming that it's the Moderna and the Pfizer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so because we can't be sure, we want to run up the score. Everyone gets vaccinated, everyone quarantines, everyone wears masks, everyone social distances, and we can end this thing. Mm -hmm. If we assume that 95% is 100% and everyone starts taking their masks off and congregating and doing whatever they want because they've been vaccinated, uh, this will propagate the, the virus even at a slower rate than non-vaccination, but it will still propagate the virus faster than if we kept all of our safety mechanisms in place, right? Yeah. This is like saying we have airbags and cars, why do we need seatbelts? And the answer mm -hmm. is because no system is perfect, so we want to be redundant. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe in one crash, the, the airbag is perfectly fine, but in the others, we want to have the airbag, uh, the airbag and your seatbelt, right? So I think it's the, the overkill is underrated approach, which mm -hmm. is just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you're the one it took for, or even if it did, uh, let's just everyone wear masks, let's just everyone be extra safe and let's nip this thing in the bud, let's run up the score. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. push back a little bit on that one. And on, only because I don't know if you guys are aware, but the, the CDC has actually updated its recommendations, right? So if you have been, vet, it's, it's a weird combo, but effectively it's if you have had two doses of your vaccine and you're two weeks out from the second dose and you are within three or four months of that timeline and you are told that you have come in contact with somebody with COVID, you are now, no, no they no longer suggest you quarantine. That it, they... Mm -hmm. If you've been vaccinated, you're not, like that's not in the CDC recommendations any longer. Um, yeah. And I think that's reflective. I mean, this is something that we can probably talk about as a group, um, but I think there's a version of this where there's a scientific answer and then there's a public health answer and they don't always line up, right? Mm -hmm. I think once you're vaccinated, I think the evidence is pretty clear that that's the best protection you're gonna get, right? Like you're not gonna get better um, that's sort of wherever you'll be, you know, and, and as Tom said, you are rolling the dice a little bit, but there's no version where you get a better roll. It, it'll always mm -hmm. be 95%. Um, but on the flip side, unless everybody's going to start carrying around cards that say I've been vaccinated, how do you know, mm -hmm. right? When somebody walks in, whether they are vaccinated or not, right? Do you just take them at their word? And so there's a, there's a little bit of this that's public health and public reaction management. And there's part of it that's science right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the scientific side of things. Um, so for example, you know, I, I would say if I were vaccinated in my own life, I don't need, I don't really see the necessity to wear a mask or social distance any longer. On the flip side, I will not stop doing it because there's a public aspect of it as well, right? So I would not consider myself a danger any longer, but I also am playing a role in keeping sort of public order while everybody gets vaccinated. And I think that's kind of the mix is there've been a lot of times where I've seen people like wearing the scientist hat and then they're wearing the public health hat and they don't tell you when they've switched hats. And so you end up kind of going, well, where's the science behind that? And mm -hmm. it, the answer is it's not really a, a science answer. It's a public health and sort of public behavior answer. Um, but I don't know what you guys think. I mean, that's obviously my own opinion that might draw some heat. So <laughs> fair no, I, 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 I would agree with that. I mean, I think that right, like, where we are now, it's definitely, you know, it's what, less 10, 20, maybe we're getting close to 20% of the population has mm -hmm. been vaccinated. And, you know, so it's not the majority by far, which is what we would need, you know, for like effective control. You know, there's still, you know, widespread cases in the community. So I think, you know, even after you get vaccinated, it's still, yeah, in the public health, you know, for those reasons, it's smart to wear your mask and, you know, and then I think for given states, you know, there's different recommendations on what happens if you, you know, do come into contact with a positive case, but you've already been vaccinated. It's a little bit of a gray area right now, but I think mm -hmm. all of it is, you know, just trying to, um, you know, like Tom said, you know, 
have as many safeguards as we can, you know, while mm -hmm. things are, while we're still like in the process of getting things under control. And then once cases start dropping, you know, then you can start being a little bit more flexible in some of these areas too. So one of the things um, that came to mind when Chris, you were talking about the science versus the public health answer is when Texas decided that they were gonna reopen everything, I know they got a lot of heat for that. Um, is that reopening sort of the science answer and then they're expecting people to still be responsible and still just because you don't have to wear a mask doesn't mean you shouldn't type deal? <laughs> is that sort uh, of the vibe you got from that or do you guys have different takes on, on, on that? You know, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. I, I generally tend to think not a lot of anything that anybody has done has been particularly science driven. I think there's a like there's a there's another game going on that like you know you wear the like the phrase the science as a shield, mm -hmm. um, but it's not about the science. It's about whatever other pressure is you're under, right? You're trying to look good in front of the camera. You're trying to signal to people whatever you want to call it. Um, the truth is, I don't I don't know what's going to happen with Texas. Tom and I were talking about this the other day, um, and I think this is an interesting. It's an experiment. Right now, a lot of people don't want to be part of a human experiment, but it is an experiment. Um, and I think one of the biggest failings I've seen during the COVID period is that people never circle back, right? So let's, you know, let's draw a line in the stand now, right? Like, like let's ask public officials, what's going to happen? Predict it for me, right? And then in a month, let's come back and say, okay, you said X, Y, or Z would happen. Did it happen or not? Um, and if it didn't, then I need you to update your model. Right, there's something wrong with the way you're perceiving everything. It's okay. We all made, you know, like you're making assumptions in your in your model and how you thought things were going to play out. But something is wrong with your model, um, or you were totally right. At which point you should continue to make predictions. Um, but I've seen a lot of things where you sort of just get to throw something at the wall, and then nobody ever asks you about it again. Right, like you know, a month later, people don't come back and say like, so you said unicorns are going to rain out of the sky on March 15th. And then March 15th rolled around, no unicorns, right? What happened? <laughs> like, can you explain to me what went wrong? Um, so I'll, I, I don't know, truth be told, what's going to happen. Um, I, if I had to make a bet, kind of guessing on the data, and I'm happy to have people come back and rub my face in this one if I'm wrong, um, I don't kind of looking at other states, I don't think Texas will do a whole lot, will not do much more, will not have a sort of a different response than its neighbors. I think it'll probably end up playing out sort of similarly. Now, whether that's because people are still wearing their masks, they're still complying, mm -hmm. they're still a little bit skittish about going in restaurants, I don't know. I, I don't know the details of it. But I think if you kind of look at states versus their neighboring states, they all seem to kind of run together. Um, so I don't know, but I, I think there's a there's a good discussion to be had there. And I, I think that's something that I personally would like to see at the end of this is somebody and kind of a group of people going through and kind of doing an autopsy of what happened and mm -hmm. what was done and and being honest about what worked and what didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we're not gonna look at the data and say, look, this didn't work, then next time this happens, we're gonna do it again, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna do, we're, if everybody believes it worked, we're just gonna do it, right? Because why wouldn't you do what you believe worked? But if nobody's gonna sit down and go, okay, this worked, that didn't work, then we won't, you know, that's how you, that's the scientific method, right? That's what science is. Science is making a guess. It's that chart that everybody got in elementary school, right? Make a hypothesis, design an experiment, ask the question, look at the results. Then we lose the last step, update your hypothesis, right? Go back to the start of the cycle. Um, so I'll be interested to see what happens. So I don't know, I'll let you guys take a, take a stab at it. But that would be my guess is it'll look similar to its neighbors. I'll bet somebody, you know, a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's hard to predict, right? And then it's hard, it's harder to make like informed policy decisions, right? If you're, mm -hmm. if you're not taking these things into account, right? So, and I think something that's been difficult is, you know, that it has been kind of such a fragmented response that there's like different criteria in different states about, you know, some states are using like 
you know, certain benchmarks and that's what kind of what's dictating when things reopen. Um, so I know just, you know, personally, I'm in California. So California has like, um, like tiers and there are like certain criteria that you have to meet to move between tiers. Um, so I think, you know, in general, I feel like it's been a good approach, but you know, California still had pretty widespread cases, you know, so how much of that, how much of a difference did it make? I hope that it made a difference, right? But we don't really know until you kind of go back and, and look at things retrospectively. So, um, Tom, do you have anything to add add to that? No, I, I agree with both of them. I think it's it's going to be incredibly hard to predict. It'll be very interesting one way or the other whether or not cases spike or they they kind of stay the way they are, or at least you know relative to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what what Katie and Chris said is right. And just because the state is easing some of their overall restrictions doesn't mean individual vendors will. It uh, doesn't mean people are going to suddenly say, well, the governor said it's cool to take my mask off, so why don't me and my five hundred of my best friends go to the bar tonight? You know, people may still implement their own safety mechanism, so it, it may not immediately translate to a spike in cases. Um, but if we could predict it, we should be in charge. Uh, and I don't know that anyone can predict it, so <laughs> we'll we'll just have to wait and see. Sounds good. All right. Uh, next question, also from Taryn, he says, uh, "He heard that the vaccine was painful for some people, where they had to call out of work for extra days because they were sick." But I don't know how that how true that is, but it's just what I heard. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just in general, there's been kind of various responses um, that people have had. So and I think in general, you know, it tends to be kind of somewhat stronger responses um, than other vaccines that people are used to, like the flu vaccine, for example. Um, and so part of that may be because, you know, we're uh, so the Pfizer and Moderna, the two RNA-based vaccines are kind of, you know, a two-shot dose. And so you you kind of get like, um, so most of the time, I think there was another question about this, so maybe we can just talk about it now, but most of the time the reactions are stronger after the second dose. Um, and so that's primarily because you kind of have, have a heightened response after um, that first one, which gives you some protection, but then you kind of amplify that protection. And so the, res the responses people are having are, you know, indica indications of, a, of immune response, right? So they're you know, yes, it may not be fun, but they are indications that the vaccine is working, right? Um, and the other thing I think, you know, that is maybe a little bit different um, is that most of, I think the, some of the stronger side effects are happening in, in younger people who are getting the vaccine um, because they have a stronger immune system. So they have more of a response, um, which is maybe some, uh, not what you would expect um, uh, going into it. But, you know, I think, you know, they're, they've been pretty mild, I think, you know, relatively they're, yes, they're worse than you might experience with some other vaccines, um, but overall, you know, uh, pretty well tolerated, I think. Mm -hmm. And I would say too, that the, um, so the specifics that people are kind of looking at, the things that people are seeing in terms of side effects are sort of your, your typical vaccine response ones just kind of amplified a little bit. So mm -hmm. fever is typical, headache seems to, ha to show up in a handful of patients aches, chills, um, things like that, right? So not not disease symptoms, but but soreness at the site of injection, um, swollen lymph nodes. So things that are, are fairly typical and are kind of uncomfortable, right? I, I know at least personally for me as well, I don't know about you guys, but a headache is like my thing, right? I can work through anything except a headache. I'm done if I have a headache. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if I got a really bad migraine and said, look, I gotta, I gotta tap out. I can't come in tomorrow. Um, so, in, and like Katie noted, I mean, that's a sign that you're generating that protection. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, for the people who are feeling it, um, then, you know, it, it's easy for me to say, cause I feel great right now, but, um, you know, take a, at least be a little bit, um, you can at least be comfortable knowing that you're generating the response necessary to protect you, right? That's, that's your body responding and generating the immune response. that's going to protect you in the future. Should you be worried if you do not generate um, some sort of response, like if you feel pretty much normal? No, nah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything to say that those two are correlated, right? Like you, we can say that you know because someone has uh, these, you know, these symptoms, these side effects. You know, that's we we think that's because they're generating immune response. But you could definitely, you know, have a great um, you know response to the vaccine, but not have any symptoms. So mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're, they're necessarily correlate. Everyone reacts kind of differently. So um, it's I don't think it's too much to be concerned about kind of one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. One other thing that comes to mind, and, and Tom, I want you to touch on this a little bit, is 
the sort of people having different reactions to the vaccine, is that sort of, does that correlate to people having different reactions to the virus itself? Is that because it's the same sort of protein that, or uh, RNA that gets in, that gets into you or like what, what causes that? You know, that, that's actually a really good question. I, I will make a statement that maybe Katie and, and Chris can back up. I haven't seen any data to, su to signify or, or indicate that whether or not you have a, a strong reaction to the vaccine means that you would have had a strong reaction to getting COVID. So mm. it could be. I haven't seen anything or, or heard anything that would suggest it's true, but equally, I've heard nothing to say it isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, I think it, it's important to know kind of what, what I think Katie mentioned earlier, that depending on the age of the individual, younger individuals tend to have more robust immune uh, responses because they're younger and their immune system is, is kind of leaner and meaner, if you will. As we age, it, it tends to mellow out. And um, that's why older people historically can, can get ill uh, a little more easily. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if the two are, are related or if it's due to something else entirely. I, I imagine there are just so many variables. Um, one of the ways the immune system recognizes proteins like this is through what's called MHC, major histocompatibility complexes. So these are, are proteins that can present part of the spike protein, so a, a piece of it, uh, in a kind of controlled fashion to T cells, which will result in them activating if they're the appropriate counterpart T cell. And the reason I bring this up is because everybody has different versions of the MHC. They're all the same in the sense of, again, I seem to like car analogies today. Um, if you have a car that's red or blue, it, it functions very similarly, right? It's, but there are some differences. Maybe you have a, a RAV4 versus a Corolla. Uh, again, they both do the job of taking you and stuff from point A to point B, but they're a little different, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the MHC could play a role into this depending on... Um, your exact combination of, of which version you have and every person put 10 people in a room and you're gonna get 10 different answers. Uh, so yeah. they all are, are very similar in what they do, but they all have subtle variations that could affect how strong an immune response you get. Uh, and this is me sort of extrapolating. Again, I haven't seen the data to fully support this yet. Maybe Katie or Chris have, um, but it's a, it's a reasonable yeah. uh, assumption. But yeah, again, it just comes down to patient variability. Yeah, and I think one thing that's, it's. A little tricky here is you know because this is a new type of a vaccine we don't kind of know how much of this is driven just because of how the, the the vaccine works right so there's not really we don't have another thing to compare for a given person for most people this would be the first rna vaccine they've gotten right so you can't compare against and say is it something inherent about the spike protein about you know it being a covid vaccine or is it just because it's it's an mrna vaccine and you just are generating a stronger response to that so um, you know, maybe once we start developing more of these for other diseases, then you'll be able to make those types of comparisons, but we don't have that yet. Gotcha. One, one other uh, thing that came to mind before we get back to the questions, but um, Tom talked about the, your immune system being more robust when you're younger. What sort of things just generally can people do to help keep their immune systems uh, strong in day-to-day -day life in general? Yeah, so it's a good question. So the Naturally, diet is going to be huge, right? Vitamin C is good for your immune system. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. You get those what, airborne where they give you 10,000% of your vitamin C in a given day, vast majority of which is just going to pass right through you. But um, nutrition does help. Exercise absolutely helps. Um, people have shown that, that if you're cardio and weightlifting, that they tend to have, you know, and again, all of these are, are correlations and probabilities, but people who exercise and eat well tend to have better immune systems later in life. Um, it's also been shown that as you age, your thymus, which is a, a gland where um, your T cells mature, tends to get fattier uh, as you age. And with that, your T cells don't mature as well. And that can lead to a, a weakened immune response later in life. So I think diet and exercise are, are two of the biggest factors that we as individuals can control over trying to be healthy later in life. And I think that that's probably true outside of the immune system too, right? Your more muscle you have, the better your cardio is, the better you eat, uh, the healthier you're going to be across the board, uh, including your immune system. Gotcha. Yeah, and there's a funny fact that a lot of people don't know about the immune system, which is it sort of has two circulations going on, right? So it, it circulates in your blood, which is driven by your heart. So that's obvious. But the second way that, that immune cells circulate is through your lymph. It's called like it's lymphatic vessels, right? So it's a secondary fluid called lymph. Um, and it goes through these lymphatic vessels, which basically are one-way valves, and it only moves when you move. It's not hooked up to a pump, 
right? So like it moves by you kind of moving and pressure pushes things through and it's a one-way valve, right? So there is some evidence that just being moving regularly, right? So doing a little bit of exercise, a little bit of cardio, like there's a mechanism by which it makes sense that your immune system gets a better sense of things because your lymph is probably circulating better than if you were sitting at a desk all day or, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise it, it doesn't move that much unless you are moving. So it, um, I, I could see a scenario where that would be helpful. Um, and even if you, you look at sort of the COVID breakdowns, it's a tough, it's a tough analysis to make in the United States because we do have, I mean, myself included, a lot of people who are overweight, um, you know, from a medical perspective. Um, but when you kind of look at the breakdown, the number of people who, you know, who fall into the hospitalization and death category who have no comorbidities is exceedingly small. Um, and it's so it, there's an aspect of, of personal health um, that I think will, that should carry on beyond COVID, right? It's just generally, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I'm, you know, actually going through an exercise kick, I feel better. I have better energy. I'm much harder to go down on like a sickness or, a, you know, my kids are little germ factories. They're always bringing home colds. Um, you know, if I'm in good shape and kind of running around, uh, it's pretty hard to take me down. Um, but I, you know, on the weeks where I'm really crammed down into the office and I really can't get out and exercise, I find myself getting the sniffles more often. So totally correlative to myself. Um, but it, uh, I, I think it's probably true broader than just me. Katie, do you have anything to, to add to that? No. Sorry, Those Mike. Sorry, uh, my connection's a little bad, but yeah. No, you're good. Do you have anything to add? Do you have anything to add to that, or are you or not really? No, yeah, I think that was great. I actually didn't know that about uh, about lymph, uh, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, and it's the thing. So like, if you see, you know, there's a, some patients who have things like elephantitis, right? So you have swelling of different mm -hmm. um, parts of their body. It's not that they're full of blood; it's that those sections have filled with an alternative fluid mm -hmm. called lymph, um, which is occasionally also shown as as kind of pus. So it's it's another it's a different fluid um, mm -hmm. that your immune system carries a lot of its kind of network information through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, I'm sure everyone here has heard that when you're on long flights, you're supposed to stand up and walk around a little bit, or you can have lymph pooling in your legs, right? So you can have swelling of the legs if, if you're potentially elderly, people have it a lot and you're sitting for too long. So you're supposed to get up and walk around and for that exact reason that, uh, as Chris said, there's no pump pushing this, you are the pump. When your muscles contract, when you move, it applies pressure, which pushes it through the valves. So we see this elsewhere too, where it's absolutely true that moving moves the lymph. Mm -hmm. um, and one other thing to throw in there too is, is I think it's been pretty well established that stress can cause a, your immune system to get dampened. Uh, chronic stress, extra cortisol flowing through your blood will keep your immune system suppressed. Uh, so in the workaday life where everybody works very hard, um, spends a lot of time on, on stressful things every day, uh, that can be detrimental to your health for a number of reasons, including high blood pressure and other stuff. Uh, but definitely for for suppressing your immune system too. So I think the exercise can be twofold, which is one, of course, actually helping your immune system, and two, a lot of people use it as a stress reliever. Um, so anything that can anything you can do to relax too can actually be helpful. So eating healthy, moving, exercise, and, and try to mitigate stress. Good point. And for those wondering what T cells are, go check out episode seven, shameless plug. But we talked about that then. Um, all right. The next question we kind of touched on on, on it already, but as I've heard that the second dose of vaccines has stronger side effects than the first. If true, why is this? I know we touched uh, touched on it a little bit. Do um, you think what, what we mentioned was sufficient or, or are there some other things that you would like to mention? I think Katie, you touched on that the first time. Would you like to kind of describe, describe why again? Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, we talked... I said before, you know, it's you're kind of amplifying this response, right? So um, even though you have an initial um, immune response to the first dose, the second one is what really um, amplifies it and gives you the full protection. So that's why you tend to see more side effects after the second dose. Um, something I actually don't know, and maybe Chris and Tom, you guys can talk about this because I know there's, you know, Pfizer and Moderna are doing this two dose schedule. Johnson Johnson is is one dose, and you know, I think it was interesting, kind of, you know, when that gets decided, right? Because you have to fix some of these things, you know when you do the dosing, how many doses that has to be fixed kind of before you move to these large, like, you know, phase three type trials. Um, so I don't actually know, you know, how much of that is empirically decided early on and then, um, or kind of, you know, it just worked out that way. And that it seems to be, because, you know, 
Pfizer and Moderna have really good you know, um, efficacy, but then I think Johnson Johnson's a little lower. So is that because it's only one dose? I don't know if you guys have thoughts about that. Yeah, so there's um, there's a funny story about this <laughs> that sort of that kind of um, gives a clue as to how these things work out. So there's a fourth vaccine that's been approved in other countries, the um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, right? That hasn't been approved in the United States yet. And the funny story of the AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, they set up a dosing schedule, right? And the plan was to try two things. It was going to try two standard doses or a a high dose followed by a standard dose. That was, the, I'm pretty sure that was the plan, but there were two There were two dosing regimens. One where you got the same dose twice and one where you got a different dose um, at the first one. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was through kind of a paperwork error and clerical error, um, a dose of, a bunch of people in Britain got the wrong first dose. So they, instead of getting the same, they were supposed to be in this, the double same dose, right? So they're supposed to get, you know, whatever, 50 milligrams on the first day, 50 milligrams on their second dose. But instead, they got a low first dose and a high second dose, or sorry, a low and a standard, right? So this was never, it wasn't the plan to test this. It just sort of happened through some paperwork errors. And then ironically, what happened was when the data came out, so AstraZeneca came forward and they said, look, we tracked down this paperwork thing. We didn't plan to have the second dose group. We planned, we never planned to do this, mm -hmm. um, but, that dose group had the best efficacy. So the totally random mystery dose group, you know, it wasn't a mystery, they knew what they got, but the totally unexpected random dose group was the protective one, mm -hmm. um, which is happens surprisingly often in science. Um, the like thing I didn't know I was doing is the thing that works. But so part of the, the reason that this ties into what Katie was saying is the, the other countries have taken this data and they have approved the vaccine, right? And the United States FDA said, you weren't planning on doing that. So, right, like it's sort of like a court system where it's like, sorry, can't look at it, right? Like mm -hmm. you didn't plan to do that. So we can't consider it, right? It's, it's you know, it's data from the poisonous tree. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so instead what AstraZeneca is doing is that they, they've set up a new phase three trial where they're gonna test officially the dose, you know, the new dosing regimen that they uh, accidentally developed along the way. Um, and so then they will get that approved, you know, they, we, that will eventually be approved. I, I looked up some scheduling. It kind of suggests that kind of April, May is when that one will probably make its way through the FDA process. Um, but so they, they ended up getting a setback because they sort of guessed on the dose and it, it wasn't what they designed in their trial. So when you design a clinical trial, you do have a plan, right? Like you have mm -hmm. a planned dose schedule, um, but somewhere along the lines, they, you know, the companies made a judgment call, which was, you know, Moderna said, look, we want to make sure we get the best efficacy out of this deal. This is what I imagine happened in their, I don't know what happened in their mm -hmm. boardroom, but I imagine what happened in their advisory board meetings was, listen, if this thing doesn't work, we're not going to get approved. So take the conservative approach, dose people twice, prime boost. They probably had some mouse models that suggested they could get better efficacy out of two doses or a better immune response that I know they had done some, um, some monkey clinical trials as well. And so they probably had some internal data that if they gave people, or they gave, at least if they gave monkeys two doses, that they got a better protection than if they gave them one dose. Um, and so they committed to the two dose schedule, right? And then they tried it and then they stuck with it because if you start to fiddle with it, um, you know, much like getting a mortgage, if you start to fiddle with what you were doing, you, the bank gets uncomfortable. If you start to fiddle with the clinical trial protocol, the FDA gets uncomfortable and they tell you like, whoa, 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 like we're not, we don't know, we don't like what's going on here. Um, so a good example of that along the like the Moderna Pfizer vaccines is that I think it was maybe a week or two ago, the New England Journal of Medicine published an update on these vaccines. And what they did was they went back through and they found people who fell off the vaccine schedule, right? And they selected specifically patients who only got one dose. Mm -hmm. and asked it and asked if they were protected right because we never tested one we just tested two and then it worked yeah. and then if it's not broke don't fix it right um and it turns out that if you get a single dose you're you know from those kind of smaller studies um you're anywhere from 80 to 90 percent protected mm -hmm. right and but now we're sort of committed right so to get the fda to move it's probably not going to happen right unless you're going to do another trial with one dose and see what happens there 
Um, and I just don't think there's a lot of push or a lot of interest in developing that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So it's a little bit of both. The company has an idea when they go in. Um, and then if they want to modify that idea, they sort of have to go back to the start. So if it works, they're very hesitant to touch it because you know, if it worked the first time and now you spend a whole bunch of money on a second clinical trial and it didn't work, what'd you do, right? Like you, you just wasted a bunch of money um, yeah. and you didn't get anything out of it, right? Like you're not getting goodwill points for a failed mm -hmm. clinical trial. Nobody's going, yay, thanks Moderna for checking that out. Um, so there's not a lot of yeah. incentive. Yeah, that makes sense. So is this, to, from the original question, it's just, you're just amplifying the second and that's why it's just stronger. Yeah. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. I do, I didn't want to stop you, Chris, because that was all really good information, um, <laughs> for sure. All right, um, next question for, we'll, give, we'll throw this one Tom's way. Uh, it says, I think any explicit information about the severe side effects from the vaccinations coming out would really help. Last time uh, you guys were on, uh, he says, I remember that we went through some of the recorded info from the early clinical trials before um, before they had been approved. So it's more of a comment than question, but it, are the, is the information for the side effects readily readily available? Yeah, yeah. All the, the side effect data is, is published. It's out there if you check uh, Moderna's websites and Pfizer's websites, and I think mm -hmm. the CDC's probably got it as well. Uh, to run through it briefly, it, it's more or less exactly what you'd expect. And, and I'll open the floor to Katie and Chris too, if, if I miss one or, or overshoot one, but um, it's more or less what you'd expect. On the minor side, you're going to get arm pain. You're going to get some local swelling. You're going to get maybe a, a fever. Um, on the upper side, you know, I've heard of people getting headaches. I've heard of people getting, uh, you know, massive fevers for a little bit, not, not anything to you know go to the hospital over, but something that's probably going to knock you on your butt for a day or two. Um, you know, it's kind of what you'd expect. Um, when you get a vaccine, when, when really when you get symptoms from disease, uh, this is something that, that maybe a lot of people don't know is most of the symptoms come from your immune system, not from the pathogen. Uh, mm -hmm. When your immune system kicks on, you start making a bunch of cytokines and a bunch of other molecules that are designed to deal with the pathogen. Uh, but the side effect is that you as a, a host, as a human being in this case, feel pretty crummy. Uh, and it's not the pathogen, it's your immune system. So, um, it's kind of what you'd expect. You get headaches, you get fevers, you, you feel fluish, you might have stomach pain. Uh, arm pain is, is a common one. Um, not sure if there's any big ones I'm missing, Katie or Chris, but uh, I don't think there are any real ringers in there that, that yeah. we wouldn't see from other vaccines. You guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah I think the, the, the strongest you know side effects are mainly allergic reactions to some component of the vaccine that's not even related. So I know for the mRNA vaccines, if you have allergic reactions to PEG, uh, polyethylene glycol, you know, you could go into, you know, kind of anaphylactic, you, you, you would need an EpiPen. Um, so that's why they do the 15 minute observation. Um, but again, that you would know if you had a allergic reaction to something mm -hmm. like that in the past, it's like a common um, component of other vaccines. Um, and so they'll, you know, ask you when you're going to get your, your first dose. And then there's this observation period afterwards. Um, cause that would be a very quick, uh, reaction. And so they, they're just keeping an eye on people to make sure they don't see that. But I think it's relatively uncommon. You don't see that a lot. Yeah, thanks for adding that. That's a great point. If if you are allergic to that, the thing that you mentioned that I'm not yeah, going to remember. Yeah, <laughs> peg. Um, do all of the vaccines have that, or are you sort of stuck just like you're going to get the vaccine and you better have an EpiPen sitting around, or is there another option for? Yeah, uh, so I was I, I was looking at this earlier actually. So the CDC I think is saying if you if you have a known allergic reaction um, to PEG specifically, to not to get the two mRNA vaccines. Um, so I think John, the Johnson Johnson vaccine it's a DNA based vaccine, so it has different components. Um, so it, it doesn't have uh, PEG in it. So you you uh, hypothetically could get that one, not have an allergic reaction. Um, it has some other allergen that I don't remember off the top of my head, but you know, uh, you know the person administering the shot will double check with with you before you get it, you know, what do you, what are you allergic to? You know, have you had to use an EpiPen before? Um, so yeah, it's not something where you would like want to still get the, the vaccine and just like have an EpiPen on hand. Um, you probably want to, would want to avoid that specific one. But now that, you know, there's kind of a couple different options, um, people now have options. Good. Awesome. That's yeah, I should 
I should say too, um, regarding the EpiPen on hand thing, I know a lot of places are having you wait in one of their wait rooms and they mm-hmm. have medical professionals on standby. So it's not like you need to bring your own yeah. uh, EpiPen <laughs> or anything. Like you, you're not, you're not supposed to leave the premise until you've cleared the 15 or so minute window. Uh, and God forbid, if anything did happen, there are trained EMTs typically on site ready to help. And, and again, it is rare, but you're not alone in this. You're not like taking the shot and walking home, mm-hmm. counting down, hoping you don't have a problem. Yeah. Um, there are people who, who could help if that were to happen. And again, it is rare. Good, good. Glad to hear that one. Um, the next question is more on the, the grad school side of things. Uh, so is, are, prestigious, are prestigious schools like designer jeans when applying for medical school or does where you, or does where you go determine what jobs you can get slash how much you can make? I think to sort of clarify that, when when applying to medical school in the first place, does it matter what school what school you went to for undergrad? And the second one, um, does your where you do your postdoc or your doc doctorate does that matter when applying for for jobs? And if so, how much? Mm-hmm. So, Katie, we can go with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess just uh, off that, I think none of us are medically trained. So I don't know. My <laughs> my experience will be specific to grad school. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I think, you know, for grad school in particular, um, it's kind of less the school and more the specific lab that you, you train in. Um, and mm-hmm. so, you know, kind of big name schools tend to have, you know, big name labs. So it's, it's probably correlated to some extent, uh, but there's also, you know, you can get great training at, you know, you know, if, if there's a lab that's a good fit for you, that's more important than going to like the best name school. Um, so I think that's something that's a little bit different maybe than, you know, grad school or law school where, you know, I think it does, maybe the name carries more weight. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else to add, but um, I think there's lots of different paths, you know, and so I think for grad school in particular, it's really about, you know, what specific research you want to do and what's the best path for that. Mm-hmm. Chris, does it matter the name of the, the school when applying to jobs, like after you've done your sort of your doctorate, or does, or like once you get to that point, is the field so specific and narrow that it kind of doesn't really matter at that point? There's only a handful of schools that have that particular sort of program. Is it kind of, yeah. the, is, is kind of that one? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I mean, at least when I, so when I look at resumes, I'm um, fairly uninterested with the name of the school. Um, you know, once you've got the degree, then I'm more interested in your publication record and I'm more interested in projects you've worked on and who you've worked with. Mm -hmm. So like Katie said, you know, I'll I'll look at who your parent lab was, you know, who was your mentor? Do I know them? Do I know anybody who knows them? Um, And same thing for a postdoc, right? Like, do I know, do I know this name? And then I can kind of, I can do a little bit of diving, right? So I can look in to see what this lab has published and do I like their data? Do I not like their data? Do I think they do well with methods or not? Um, and then there's a chance in sort of the interview process too, for, I mean, at least what I always try to do is try to, to quiz people on their technical skills. Right. And so I always ask like a pretty awkward question, but I've learned to just commit to it, which is, you know, I'm going to give you whatever the technique is. Um, you know, let's say I handed you a vial of cells. Now I want you to walk me through how you would do whatever this thing is in as much excruciating detail as possible. Right. Like just tell me every single step. Um, And a lot of people shy away from that, right? They're like, I don't really want to bore you. I'm like, no, bore me. Give me every number, how many times you pipe, give me the whole thing. Um, Because your your hands and your technical skills are far more important to me than your credentials. Um, And I think that's probably true in a lot of companies. I mean, I I would be amiss at saying that there aren't people who look at your resume and kind of do the old boys club thing. They're like, oh, you know, you're from whatever school. Um, But I think you don't want to be employed by those people, or at least I don't want to be employed by those people. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, if anyone listening is thinking of applying to Werewolf anytime soon, Chris is giving away his interview secrets. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, give me all the details. <laughs> That's my one tip. Yeah, <laughs> Tom, have you sort of found similar things to, to what the other two mentioned? Yeah, yeah, and you know, to speak to my own personal experience. Um, I did my undergraduate work at at James Madison University in Virginia, which I enjoyed. It's a good school. It's got a a good science program. I don't know a lot of people that would call that a massively large name school. Uh, I think if you went to the West Coast, they'd say where, right? So that being said, after I graduated, I went and worked in a lab uh, with a guy named Chuck Drake for four years uh, post-graduation. And then at that point, I applied to graduate school and, and had a, you know, not to toot my own horde, but had a fairly successful interview cycle, had a couple of options on the table, which I appreciated. 
Uh, and a lot of that I think was due to my experience, due to the people I met, due to Chuck's recommendation letters, due to a bunch of kind of intangible elements that are, are separate from your degree and your GPA and all these things. It's really the experience as, as Katie and Chris said, uh, what lab were you in? What projects were you involved with? Who did you meet? Who was willing to vouch for you? Uh, and these are things that you can get by joining a lab and getting these experience. And again, this is on the graduate PhD side. I don't, I can't speak to the medical side, um, but I do know it seems like a lot of people would rather have a, a reputable person write you a letter of recommendation and say, hey, this person is awesome. I worked with them for two to four years. I really appreciated them uh, and they'd be good in your school. And, and that can go an incredibly long way um, when compared to something like a name named school. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I think like Chris said, you know, you're going to find people out there who are going to look for the Harvard, the Yale, the, um, you know, Stanford and some of these other places that have fantastic names and they're going to say you came from there, therefore I'm interested, but I think there's a ton of excellent programs and excellent labs and excellent schools out there that will very seriously consider anybody if they've had good experiences in labs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think a name is a, a kiss of death. I think it's, it's helpful, right? But at the end yeah. of the day, uh, your lab experience is probably the number one thing that matters. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, next question is: With the COVID nineteen pandemic, we were shown we were shown the, the world seriously needed a restructure on pandemic preparation. What what would you do? Slash, what do you think needs to happen to help us better prepare to handle the next pandemic? That's open ended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll you know see. everything we've done since the start. We'd either do the opposite of that. <laughs> and that's the short answer. Um, I'll throw a couple of things out and, and maybe Chris and Jenna, if, or oh, sorry, heck now I did it, Katie. Um, you got my head, Chris. Um, I'm sorry, Katie. Yeah. It's fine, it's fine. Uh, it's sorry, I gave man. Tom so much flack on the last episode for doing that to yeah. you, and now I did it myself too. So I feel I'm <laughs> welcome kind to of looks similar to you, so it's still <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think communication is key, right? Having a, a clear, decisive plan from the start, from higher ups, from, from on local levels, federal levels, institution levels. Um, I think that can go a long way to, to getting the population to agree to a strategy and a plan and pull the trigger and get it done. Uh, clearly, supply chain management, that's been a, a crucial thing of making PPE and getting it sent to the right places. And um, that's something that clearly needs to be worked on. There need to be more... more kind of flexibility there that we can't just immediately get shut down. Um, just agreeing on different tests and what they mean. I think we talked mm -hmm. briefly last time about the PCR test and the CT values and how there's still confusion on that side about what a positive PCR test means or doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, drop off there. There's more to talk about, but if Katie or Chris want to throw more out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, especially in the beginning, you know, having a lack of testing was a big problem, right? Because then you're kind of flying blind as to, you know, where are outbreaks happening, um, you know, especially since there seems to be kind of a, a range of, of symptoms, right? So you have some people who are asymptomatic, but can infect others. You have some people who are, you know, ending up in the ICU. So there's a whole spectrum, right? And if you aren't testing, you don't really have a sense of, of how things are progressing, right? So I think other countries did a better job, you know, early on getting, getting wide field testing available. Um, and that made a big difference. Um, so I think we're kind of paying the price a little bit for, for not, for being slow with that. Um, I mean, it, you know, nothing like this has happened, you know, in our lifetime. So I think it's, you know, it's hard to uh, be prepared, but I think that we've definitely learned a lot about, you know, how to implement, um, you know, wide field testing. So hopefully that is something that, you know, in the next, if this, something like this happens again, you know, we can roll out much faster next time. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the thoughts I, I have are, I agree with what Tom and Katie said. I, I think those are both excellent points. Um, I think there's another conversation that needs to be had and it's, it's a difficult one to have. And it kind of circles back to what we were talking about earlier where people aren't going back and learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I, I find that I can forgive making um, when people make decisions without all the information, right? So I think there's a lot that, you know, if, if you are to call a lot of the decisions at the beginning of the pandemic into question, um, there's a version of that that's Monday morning quarterbacking and saying, well, we didn't know, right? Why did we wipe down all the chip bags? Because we didn't know, right? That's right. like, maybe it's on the, the food outside. I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Get the Lysol wipes, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, 
but there's a version of this too where then people don't like there there's not a lot of adaptation and and repairing of things um so and i think that ties into the other issue which is there's a hard, there's a there's a break between the science and the population and there's not good translators in the middle scientists are not good translators in general um you found the only four <laughs> people who can speak about this. <laughs> um, but you can't communicate these ideas in 50 second sound bites. It just can't be done. Nobody could do it. Um, and so there's a breakdown between what the labs are pumping out and then what the public sees and what's reported on it. Um, and I think there's some good examples of that, that, um, that we need to fix as a society, right? We need more of these translators. So you know, one example that came to mind for me was I remember early on, the reason we were wiping down all the groceries was there was one study that came out that said it can live for three or four days. You know, the COVID virus can live for three or four days on a solid surface, right? But then if you looked into that study, what they did was they put COVID vaccine, you know, they put viral particles on the ideal situation for a viral particle, right? They put it in an incubator with the right humidity on a plate that it liked on stainless steel. Nobody was blowing wind on it or, you know, that they put it in the ideal situation. And then it turned out that if you just took that flask and put it outside for 15 minutes, it died, mm -hmm. right? And so there was a, there's a, a disconnect, right? So the first study comes out, and then it's just reported to the high heavens, right? COVID lives forever on everything. It's yeah. everywhere. It's a ghost, right? It's just everywhere. It's in your house. It's on your food. It's, you know, it's floating through the air, through your window, right? It's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't anybody to stop and say, listen, we publish these studies all the time, right? Like we publish studies and it happens a lot in the immune oncology field, right? You, I feel really bad for cancer patients because I feel like cancer patients get get stung by this particular problem a lot. And this was the first time the general public got stung by it. So cancer research has this problem, which is lots of people will publish a study and then a news organization will pick it up and they'll say, new drug XYZ, is it the new breakthrough for cancer? And so that if you're a cancer patient, you go, what is it, right? Like I need answers, I need options. Mm -hmm. and so you look into it. And then it turns out what they did was they put a cell line in a dish and then they put some of the drug on top of it and the cells die, mm -hmm. right? And there's a great X XKCD comic about this where they say, I, I wish we had it. If, if we do show notes, I'll send it to you so we can link to it. Um, but it's addressing this point, right? So the basic gist is whenever you see a study that says, you know, this drug kills cancer in a dish, remember that if you, that a gun does the same thing, right? If you happen to just shoot the dish and there was no more media in it, the cancer would die too. If you opened the dish and set it outside, it would die. If you put it in the microwave, it would die. If you just didn't feed it because you didn't want to go in on the weekend and change the media, it would die. Um, and so there's an aspect of this where you need somebody to come out and say, listen, I understand their data is not wrong, but the interpretation is wrong, mm -hmm. right? When, when you put something in an ideal lab environment, it is not the same as putting it in real, real life. Um, and so we sort of did that a lot of times, right? Like we, yeah. we would get whatever the, whatever the panic thing of the moment was, and then it would get screamed to high heavens yeah. without anybody going, Hey, wait a second. Like that doesn't say that, right. That's not what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, even now with like, right. We talked about the, the variants, right. I remember it was only December where everybody was talking about how the variants were coming and all the waves were going to happen. And these ones were infecting children, watch out. Um, oh. And then, you know, cases dropped off. And now I, I read this morning that the variants are something like 20 or 30%, you know, of the, the, um, the infections in the United States, but the cases still dropped off. It doesn't look like they infect children that much more. Right, somebody had one inclination. Yeah. They published one study, and then everybody took it, and ran with it like it was true. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. That's something that's been particularly hard, you know, during COVID because like the research is happening so fast and it gets picked mm -hmm. up, and you know, it's such, you know, it's and on everyone's mind, right? It's like affecting everyone's daily life. So I think you know, news organizations want to report on new things that are coming out, but a lot of times, yeah, there are caveats 
you know, I think it's kind of, you mentioned this earlier, Chris, you know, this um, distinction between how we would talk about things in like a, a scientist versus how, you know, what is the way to talk about them for public health. And I think mm-hmm. even now with, you know, do you wear a mask after you get vaccinated? You know, I think that there's the, like the right public health answer, but maybe mm-hmm. that like undermines some of the confidence of the science, right? Like, do I still need to wear a mask because the vaccine didn't work? And it's like, no, it works, but it's like, we still want everyone to wear a mask, right? So right. I think you, you know, changing how we talk about these things is, is something that, that hopefully we all learn something from, you know, um, just because you're asking, you're asking you wear a mask after you get vaccinated, it doesn't mean the vaccine didn't work. It's just, we think that most people should still be wearing masks. And if people, if everyone stops, you know, then, you know, people who aren't vaccinated lose that protection, right? So um, it's, it's, there's a lot of caveats yeah. to these things. I think you, you have to talk about them or say like, why, why are we giving this type of advice and not just expect people to follow it um, without mm-hmm. understanding the reasons? I think yeah. The summer, the summer, Chris, there was oftentimes when I would see something on the news or like somebody that I had played soccer with two weeks before had had like a positive case. I remember I called you a couple of times this summer and I was like, <laughs> should I be worried about this or not? And every single time you were like, no, they're fine. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, it's hard, right? I mean, I, it's, the problem is that other, it's hard to come up with an example because there's not a lot of other arenas that like, that affect everybody's life. But for the first, maybe the first time in a long time, infectious disease became on everybody's plate, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was looking at it going, what is this? Well, I heard somebody say this. Well, I heard somebody say that. Um, And one of the things people don't understand too about, about sort of how the scientific publications work too is that there's there's sort of two ways, there's a way science is supposed to work. And then there's a way that it kind of, I feel like really does work. And you guys can comment on this one too. Um, what's supposed to happen is, you know, Eric, you publish a paper, right? And you say, this protein does this thing, right? And then Katie, Tom, and I all try to replicate it, right? Eric publishes it. And there's a version of this where it's like, I don't like Eric and I want to make him, you know, pay for this. <laughs> and then there's a version where I'm like, I really like Eric. Let's see if it works, right? Either way, I'm gonna try and replicate what you did, right? And then what's what happens is if I can't replicate it, but I also can't find anything wrong with your data, I just stop looking at it, right? Mm-hmm. That's what happens is I, I don't demand that you retract it. I don't call you out on the carpet and say, Eric, this data is wrong. I can't make it happen, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why you're wrong. Instead, we just sort of stop talking about it, right? And it just sort of goes away and that's kind of it. And that I feel like has happened to a lot of things in COVID land too, right? Which is, you know, we talk about this thing and then we just sort of stop talking about it, right? Like it just sort of goes away, right? Like we we talked for a while about over the summer, we talked that kids were super spreaders, right? Like it's not just that they spread it, they were super spreaders. And then we just sort of stopped talking about it, right? We didn't come back and say like, nobody came out and did a newscast and said, look, in July, I said this thing and I feel really bad about it. They just sort of stop talking about it, right? It just goes away, right? You know, we talked about Kawasaki syndrome in children, right? Like all the children who get it are getting this crazy multi-organ inflammatory disease. And then it turns out like it does happen, but it's pretty rare. Um, so we just stop talking about it, right? Or we talk about, right, like athletes are going to have myocarditis and heart damage. And then we just sort of stop talking about it, right? And I mean, even like a week ago, the I think it was the NBA, NFL, NHL, WNBA, they all published a joint statement where they took part in like this study. They did like a study, right? Because they had a bunch of athletes playing and they had roughly 800 athletes test positive for COVID and about half a percent of them showed this heart damage phenotype, right? So they were scanning them and they showed inflammation of the heart. But I mean, this is their job. So those people went back to exercising like a week later, right? Like Mm -hmm. they, they got off their symptoms. And then a month later, their heart stuff resolved, right? Because that happens sometimes. You get these lingering scans. Um, but again, nobody goes back and says, hey, listen, you remember when we were all like really worried about, right? We just stopped talking about it. That's what happened is we just didn't say anything, but everybody kind of remembers. And so you're left with this sort of fear of like, well, what about that? Because nobody comes out and corrects it and is like, okay, no, no, no. We, I know we said that, mm-hmm. my bad. <laughs> like Now this is where we're at. And this is why, here's the data. Yeah. You know, I was worried about this. I saw this study, but I don't know how you have that conversation unless the public's willing to listen to an hour and a half of somebody going, here's the graphs I had. Here's the new graphs, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's hard. And I think this arena is great. I mean, there's other long form podcasts to kind of discuss these things, but 
I don't know how you do it in a news cycle in like a traditional news cycle. I don't know how I, you know, yeah. what's the advantage to me going out on, on CNN or some other thing and knowing that I only have 30 seconds. And so for 20 of those seconds, I'm going to go, listen, I got this real wrong, but okay. Now I'm cut to commercial. Yeah. That sounds like hopefully we'll have learned some lessons for the next go around if there is one, but um yeah, I think just like interpretation of like what people are saying, just like staying calm. I think it's probably probably the, the biggest thing. Like, don't go out and buy all the toilet paper immediately. <laughs> it's like would probably be, be a, good, a good start. But all right. Um the next next question uh from Savannah. Any thoughts or ideas as to what the long-term effects of contracting COVID might be, like five, 10, or 20 years down the line? Could there be negative effects to the health of those who contracted the virus in the future? Tom, you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. So, so kind of branching off of Chris's previous comments, right? We don't know. There's a chance that I'm going to say some stuff here that in three months is going to get pulled back and say, no, that's not really true, or maybe we're blowing it out of proportion. But there have been reports of, as, as Chris said, there could be heart damage. Um, I know that there are some people who... Uh, feel foggy. They have kind of mental acuity issues long term. Uh, I know there, there's fatigue. People feel like they, they really got kind of worked over and it could be months before they really start to feel better again. Um, so there's kind of reports of some of these, what, what I'll kind of put as, as more serious symptoms um, that you could potentially have. That being said, I don't know the percentages of people who report them off the top of my head. So I can't imagine it's a huge fraction of people who get them. Uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a pharmacologist just the other day, and, and he was saying that they were seeing people come into the hospital who were young, who were having blood clots uh, mm -hmm. post-infection. So they were recommending that people sleep on their stomachs because it takes the pressure off of your lungs if you were to have a blood clot. Um, so again, these are all one of these like, it's like wearing your seatbelt every time you get in the car. Vast majority of the time, you're not going to get in an accident. So it's, it's all preventative and it's really not going to come into play, but occasionally it will come into play and you might be grateful you did it. Um, so I can't tell you exactly how likely it is that these things can happen, but there are definitely people out there who have had blood clots. There are people out there who have mental acuity issues, who have massive fatigue. Uh, I, I've read reports of people losing, you know, 50 pounds of muscle mass and these were healthy dudes and, you know, it can happen. Some, some very odd symptoms can happen uh, and definitely the heart damage. Um, so there are, there are lots of possible long-term effects of getting COVID, but I won't speak to the probability of getting them because I don't know off the top of my head. I imagine it's low, but uh, I just don't have those numbers, so I won't report them. Yeah. Uh, Katie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was to say, I think following up even from what Chris said earlier, you know, like these reports of kind of dramatic, uh, like long-term side effects are, the, are what make publications and what make the news, um, but mm -hmm. the vast majority of people who get COVID and recover, you know, even if they did have, you know, a pretty serious um, infection, you know, won't have these like long-term uh, effects. So I think that's something that, yeah, it's, it's not as flashy, but is probably closer to the truth. So. <laughs> yeah. And I will say along that line, not to, to go back in time here and, and go back to the previous segment, but uh, I think part of this is that the public is getting to see under the curtain, under mm -hmm. the hood a little bit here that like, this is more or less the scientific process, to be honest, it, it looks chaotic. Uh, and it is, but typically we don't report all of this stuff in real time. We, the community, review it. We say which ones we, we think are reasonable, replicable, not, and we build off of it. And then the general public typically gets brought in towards the end once we've kind of sorted through the noise of a new yeah. area. Um, given the speed of COVID, the public is not getting the reviewed stuff six months, 12 months, 18 months, five years, 10 years later, you're getting the thing that was published yesterday, which very few people have taken a look at and nobody has verified if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I bring this up is this doesn't mean it isn't working. This means you're getting to see the drafts, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had to, to write a huge inaugural address and everybody got to read every draft every day you made, not the final product. You don't get to hear just the final. I get to hear every stupid paragraph you put in there that mm -hmm. you then took back out later and said, no, that was, that was a terrible paragraph. We're not going to include that. But I got to read that every time for six months, right? This is what's happening. It doesn't mean the final address isn't going to be awesome. Uh, what it means is you're going to see all the stuff that wasn't quite right because that's how drafts work, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's happening here as a new study comes out and it says, you can get heart palpitations. It's like, yeah, you can. And then 10 more come out and say, yeah, but it's only in 0.03% of the population that get COVID. You say, okay. 
So now it's in the possible but unlikely category. Yeah, but when it first came nobody, out, it was only in the possible category and mm -hmm. possible inflicts fear, right? Yeah, and nobody sees the next 10 that say, oh, it's only this small percentage. Yeah, they only see the first exactly. one. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's happening is, is people mm -hmm. are seeing the scientific process play out in real time, but they're not seeing the checks that we put in because you're, you're seeing the product before it's finished. You're seeing no. the prototype, not the final. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Uh, next question is, do the current practices of many public spaces and restaurants actually help prevent the spread of COVID, like wearing your mask, but not at the table, like not when you're eating, or like six feet between tables? That sort of stuff. Does that does that actually help? <laughs> You're just trying that? to get us in trouble, aren't you? I'm not trying to get you guys in trouble. This is what the people want to hear. Um, I'm happy to to take that one, but I'm going to lean on you two to back me up. Go um, right, Tom. Yeah, right. So I I, I think the short <laughs> answer is going to be we're going to operate in the shades of gray territory. You're asking better or worse is, is a scale, not an absolute, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is it better to wear masks? Sure, right? It, it, neutral or better. It can't possibly hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, is it better to space people out? Can't hurt. It's either neutral or better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, fewer people indoors, having windows open, all of which is going to be better or neutral, right? It can't hurt. How much it helps is the question mark, right? And, and I don't have the numbers, so I, again, I won't speak to them. Uh, but I can tell you that, that just based on logic, Really and truly, if we wanted to, to nip this thing in the bud, we would shut down all businesses everywhere. Every single person would stay home for two weeks and that would be it, right? So what you're really asking is, is it safe enough to open up businesses and, and try and do both the economy and safety simultaneously? Um, so I can tell you that if you're infected and you're walking around a restaurant without a mask, you're probably going to infect more people. Um, that being said, if you're infected and you're sitting at a table by yourself, you're probably still dangerous to some people. Uh, but maybe if I'm on the far corner away from you in that restaurant, I have a higher probability of being safe. Um, so I imagine all of these things help. It's just a, a semantic question of how much, 5%, 20%, 50%, 90%. And, and I don't know, this is where I'll lean on, on Katie and Chris, I don't know that those numbers are, are really fully known. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think one thing that's interesting actually is, um, I mean, because so obviously, you know, this is the first time the world has dealt with COVID-19. So we don't really have a lot to benchmark against as to how these uh, measures are working. But what has been interesting is, um, you know, looking into things like the, the flu. So the flu in many countries has been almost non-existent now because all of these social distancing measures are in place, right? So, and we do have years of you know, historical data to compare that against, you know, the flu is a seasonal uh, disease that happens every year. So you can say that this is, you know, the flu numbers are dramatically reduced. So suggesting that, you know, what we are doing is helping prevent the spread of disease, you know, is, uh, which is, you know, where's the gray area, you know, where are we in that shade of gray? It's, it's harder to say, but definitely, I think that points to saying that, you know, what we're doing is being effective. Um, so. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that's a, a great way to look at it is we do have fewer few flu cases, so it must be doing something. Uh, mm -hmm. So it stands to reason that another similar respiratory disease would, would also be affected by these measures. Gotcha. But I will say too, I mean, on, along those lines, the flu's down everywhere, right? Even in countries that didn't do much, it just sort of went away. I, I don't have an explanation for it, mm -hmm. but like it's gone in India, right? I, how is it gone in India? Right? I, how is that even possible? <laughs> right? like, I have no idea. I mean, I'm not saying like I can yeah. explain it, um, but I think like, these are the kind of things, right. That there's a question here mm -hmm. that needs to be answered, right. Because I, at the end of the day, I'd say all three of us are interested in trying to protect the most people possible. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that any of anybody here is interested in, in security feeder, right. Like I, I feel really good about it. It didn't save any lives, but everybody feels pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, so like that, I mean, it, it kind of brings back to what we were saying at the beginning. Like I will, I really want an autopsy when this is all mm -hmm. over. I think you could make lots of synthetic controls from lots of places, right? I, I, you can watch yeah. what other places do. Um, you could, you know, I, if I were running a lab, I'd be going down to Texas right now to try and figure out what's compliance look like, because that's a big question. Yeah. You know, if everybody's still complying, but the mandate's gone, then it's a useless control. But if everybody goes, woohoo, spring break, right? <laughs> then you can find something out. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think... It's an interesting question and I, it's just, I don't, I'm not hopeful that the autopsy I want will happen. 
because it would involve going back and, and assessing damage done. And if you mm. can't score points with it, then I don't think anybody in the current arena is going to do it. Right? Like if I can't go back and be like, yeah, but that guy did it, um, <laughs> then I don't think anybody's going to do it, which is unfortunate. It is. All right. Uh, we'll get into there's a There's a couple more. Um, when I got my second shot, the nurse made a joke about how my vaccination card is the most valuable thing I have right now. It made me think, do you think that proof of vaccination could be a requirement to do things in the future, like getting on a plane? Are people going to be divided based on the vaccination? Kind of a scary thought. <laughs> I'm this still is not a science to... question anymore. Like we're no, out of science. No, it's not. Yeah, I'm we're into policy. Not, I'm still not yeah. trying to get you in trouble, but. If, Who is? If, I need to know the name. Who asked? Uh, yeah. Well, you can, <laughs> Gotta we can protect his about, sources. Yeah, we can talk about that offline if you want. <laughs> is that yeah, something that you I mean, guys can, are willing to go into? I guess. <laughs> or is that something that you guys are willing to go into? Or if, if not, we can we can go on to the next one for sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess my hope is that, you know, within the next two to three months, anyone who wants and is eligible to get a vaccine will be able to get one. And so this will kind of be a moot point, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in the meantime, you know, we're still practicing, you know, social distancing, wearing masks, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think like, so I personally, I recently got my first dose, my day-to-day -day behavior has not changed very much, right? Um, and probably won't until, you know, even after I get the second dose and, you know, the two weeks after we're in, you know, um, immunized. So I think that, probably it's, it's unlikely to happen but you know i'm not the one making these policies so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd agree i think there's additional pressures that i'm not sure i'm qualified to assess <laughs> as to mm -hmm. it um i think katie's probably right that that this will all kind of run its course and anybody who can get it who wants to get it will be able to get it in the next couple months and that'll sort of be that so going off of that then um, will there be a mask-free future or do you see them sticking around for a while, much like some other cultures um, like Japan or South Korea, they wear masks when they're sick. Do you think that that will start to be become a thing or do you think we'll start, we'll go back to sort of how things were without with no one really wearing masks? I kind of imagine a world where it's, it's both, right? If you make it voluntary, there will be people who feel ill who will voluntarily wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the answer is yes, you will see more people in the United States wearing masks during the winter months when people in the flu is going around. I don't think you're going to see like a national policy where everybody either by law mandate or just by voluntary behavior change is going to suddenly start wearing them. Um, that would be my bet is, is you might get people who say, I don't feel well, I'm going to wear a mask and you're going to get other people who say it's my right not to wear a mask and they're not going to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think given what I've seen, the United States typically behaves one of two ways about things. One, we don't really let it affect us at all. Uh, or two, we let it define our very being, right? You think back to 9-11 and before that you could buy a ticket at a terminal. You could walk up to a terminal without a ticket. You could hang out in an airport all day. Now I don't feel safe unless you make me take off my shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. So there may be people out there that, that take that approach here where it's like, well, now I've been through a pandemic. This is just who I am now. I will only wear masks and you'll get other people who don't feel the same way. That would be my guess. But again, we're in speculation territory. Yeah. I'm not an expert here. Yeah. I mean, one thing I think that will be interesting is, you know, I think it has become much more normalized now. Right. So um, I think, you know, if you saw someone wearing a mask in public before, it was, you know, kind of strange. And, you know, but I think now, like if, you know, you have a cold and you still have to go out and do things, you know, maybe it's more normalized, right? You don't feel strange wearing a mask really better. You're, you know, even if you're not, you don't have COVID, right? You're just preventing getting other people sick, which is, I think, a positive thing. So I'll be interested, yeah, to see what happens. Do you think this is like super speculation territory and at this point, do you think, how long do you think it, it'll take before like somebody can go into a public place without, like after everyone's vaccinated, even like you're good to go in without a mask, but how long do you think, do you think it'll take a while before people will not give you a weird look if you're without a mask somewhere? Do you think that transition will happen as well? I feel like personally, like that'll take some time. Um, but That's I where you live. You guys, yeah, I don't know what you guys think yeah. about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's going to be 
that's a tough question on on like a national level Mm -hmm. i don't know november yeah maybe um but like on a local level right it just it sort of depends where you go right i've I've seen pictures of florida i guess you can just walk around without a mask uh it's not really part of the u.s (laughs) in massachusetts you'll get funny looks if you're out in your own front yard so i don't i don't know Mm -hmm. um yeah i I don't know i mean i yeah i think it's going to depend on where you where you're talking about gotcha the last question is very open-ended but Sort of where are we time frame with um, getting out of the woods with COVID? What do you guys think? Tom, you're making funny faces. We'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so again, we'll, we'll preface yet again that this is not my area and anything I say is my own personal opinion and nothing more. <laughs> You um, have a disclosure. Like right, that. yeah, I'm just going to have that flash up. You can put that right in post, right? We'll, we'll put uh, it's your own personal opinion backed by years of education and research in a very similar field. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on how you want to define through the woods, right? If you want to yeah. define through the woods as cases are down, mortality is down, life is returning to normal, um, this is going to depend very heavily on the vaccination rollout. If, if kind of the ambitious plans of through summer, every American is vaccinated, um, life within the U.S. could start to return to normal come fall, and I will kind of just say, let's call it spring to be safe, right? Spring of 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bigger picture, right, is that naturally, na- naturally, we're all very focused on the United States because we live here. Uh, the world is a very big place. There's somewhere around seven and a half or so billion people. We're, we're 0.3 of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how the vaccine rollout goes across the globe is going to dramatically affect how much life truly returns back to normal, right? So that could be some time, given that a lot of these countries don't have the same infrastructure that we and a lot of the other first world countries do or developed nations do. Um, So travel abroad could be challenging for some people. So if you want to go into your local grocery store and and pick up groceries or go to your local bar, it might be fine. But if you want to go visit somewhere in Africa or Asia or Europe, that may be very different depending on their own vaccine rollouts. That might not be till the end of the year or further. Um, so I'd guess that again, on the local level, like Chris said, if you, your own city, your own town, your own life, um, end of the year, beginning of next year, globally, year, year and a half minimum. Any thoughts? Yeah, I'm optimistic for that timeline as well. Um, you know, at least yeah, in the US, right? Um, and hopefully, you know, the rest of the world is not far behind or ahead of us. So it'll be, yeah, it'll definitely, it definitely is variable. Um, but I think finally there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So that's a good, a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll take the accelerated timeline. So that, yeah. again, you, I'll, I'll say June, this is what I, I'm, and here's why, here's my rationale. Um, I saw a publication in the New York times a couple of weeks ago. And I haven't followed this up on the data side of things. So take it with a grain of salt. But it was documenting um, deaths in nursing homes compared to general population, population deaths. And what you saw was that the, the nursing home deaths completely diverged from the general population death rate. And the reason that they were putting forward was all of the long-term care facilities, for the most part, have been vaccinated as of December, January. By February, that population is well protected. Mm-hmm. Um, that population makes up nearly half the deaths. I mean, in some states, it's more than that. It's 60%. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you, frankly, if you could vaccinate everybody over 55, that accounts for almost 90% of all the deaths to COVID, yeah. right? I mean, you don't have to vaccinate everybody to get out of the woods. You have to vaccinate everybody over 55. That That's what mm-hmm. you need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Yeah, I, I think that can be done faster than say yeah. getting everybody vaccinated, right? Like, yeah. and even like we've talked on this earlier and I forgot to mention it, but the the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, right? It seems to have a little bit of less efficacy um, in terms of preventing um, milder and severe COVID, but it doesn't seem to have a difference in efficacy when it comes to preventing death, mm-hmm. right? So if it depends what you're concerned about, Right. If you're, if we're going to call the end of COVID when people stop dying, um, which is probably what I would say. I mean, that's that would be sort of my ideal. I'm not super concerned with 
people getting like sick and then getting better. Um, but if, if your goal is, you know, if we're calling getting out of the woods, decreasing deaths by 90%, I think you could get there by June with hyper-focused vaccination protocols mm-hmm. um, stratified on age, right? Yeah. And that's Which what I think, a lot, what of I think a lot of states are doing. Yeah, yeah. most of them are based on age for that exactly that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it means that we stop, you know, once everyone over 55 is vaccinated, right? Because sure. yeah. the longer these things can spread, you know, you get you know, mutation. So I think, you know, we should still work towards, you know, everyone that wants it to get it. But mm-hmm. I agree that like, I think when the at-risk population is vaccinated, that will be hopefully earlier. So. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully knock on wood that Chris's prediction is more true than, than yours, Tom. <laughs> hey, All I'm, the way in next year. Hey, I'm rooting for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm maybe rooting I'll, for maybe him. Maybe I'll but... say uh, August to be like a happy new year. <laughs> There we go. Look at you being diplomatic. <laughs> diplomatic. Tom, it's your last <laughs> chance. Last chance to fix this prediction. Nope. This was a this was a pandemic that was going to be over in a three week shutdown, and here we are, like fourteen months later. So I'm not yeah. feeling optimistic about Jack. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm wrong. I I pray I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. I'll get a mug that says I was wrong, and I'm happy about it, and I'll drink out of it every damn day <laughs> well, uh, uh, until I see it. Don't worry. Right. You can put my name on it, and I'll, I'll come back on the show if you'll let me and, and of use course. it. Of course, of um, course, only if you hold it up right at the beginning. So proudly, <laughs> proudly, I will drink through it the entire episode. Um, but until I see it, I'm I'm hesitant. Well, we've got through all the questions. It's been about ninety minutes. I appreciate having you guys back on. Um, it's been an, it's been a very educational. Hopefully, uh. Hopefully we'll be out of the woods soon. But um, any last any last rounds from anybody? If you're eligible, please Thanks get your vaccines. Thanks for having us back. It was great. Yeah. Sounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get your vaccines, Seconded. people. Get your vaccines. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.